Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the video cast for today, Wednesday, 1st of April. I hope you've had a good night's sleep. And for those of you who are watching uh, in the afternoon or evening, well, where have you been? To kick us off this morning, we have a few announcements. Uh, Tony has asked us to remind you of the Lister Hill Quiz Night on Thursday evening at 7.30pm. Please don't turn up at church or the police will probably turn up and disband the gathering. The quiz will take place online using Zoom, uh, which is not some kind of competition for Flash, uh, uh, but uh, a bit of online meeting software. How to use Zoom was emailed out on Tuesday, uh, and there will be more instructions to follow. As with shopping at Tesco, don't forget people will be able to see you, so please don't turn up in your pyjamas. Uh, we've got one more... Uh, public service announcement for you. Uh, Morrisons have said that due to the lack of toilet rolls and the large stock of unsold Easter eggs, anyone coming to a Morrisons store this morning, but only this morning, up to 12 noon, can bring back a toilet roll and exchange it for a large Easter egg of your choice. We have uh, another rainbow picture, lovely picture this one, uh, sent in by Anne, thank you very much, uh, with uh, uh, a very impressive heart-shaped hole in a, a cave, I suppose it is, a rock, uh, with a rainbow uh, in the sky, and even a bird there as well. So thank you for that, and do keep your rainbow pictures, whether they are uh, real rainbows, or that you have drawn, or stuck, or whatever, thank you for that. And hopefully, uh, Tina is going to be turning up very shortly. She's not with me at the moment. Uh, I think she's just having a chat to somebody else. And we're going to be having a look at towers and praying. So we'll be back in a moment. Or she'll be here in a moment anyway. So, just like the shopkeeper in Mr. Ben, <laughs> as if by magic, Tina's appeared. Hello, Tina. Hello there. Are you being powerful um, today? Yes. Yeah, I've been on my prayer wall. Excellent. <laughs> and what are you going to do? We're going to do something on towers. Towers, yes. Um, I hope you might have had some fun um, and some uh, powerful encounters with your prayer wall, if you have done that. Um, today, uh, I saw an, I found another little idea, which I thought was pretty cool, and that was to create a tower of thanks. Now, I know um, you families and perhaps even grandparents might possibly have some bricks in your house. Uh, these are mega blocks. You might have some Duplo, you might have some Lego. Don't worry if you haven't. Um, but um, grown ups, you could find some playing cards, perhaps, or use your creativity. We're going to build a tower of thanks. So if you get those out, you could do this uh, on your, t Nigel, hold this please. Um, you could do this on your table, you could do it at tea time, you could do it as part of your, um, whenever. But um, give everybody some bricks. You could all choose a certain colour or you could give so many out, whatever. And the idea is to build a tall, strong tower. And every time you put a brick down, you need to say thank you for something. Something that you're glad about, something that you're really grateful for, something that you really like, something that's just really positive. So, um, we'll have a go. Do you want one? Ooh, Nigel, you have to have two. I what colour would you like? I want blue. There we go, I've got one. Alright, I'm going to have purple because that was uh, the colour God gave me the other day. Purple. Okay, you start. Yes. Well, I'm going to say thank you that we have a new telephone system in at work, eventually, that means that we can be in when we're out. Very clever. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, I want to say thank you uh, for uh, my lovely husband here, who's really good Ooh. at washing up, and he's really good at ironing his own shirts. So thank you, God, for Nigel. And for good irons. Uh, what else have we got? Thank you that we can go for a walk round the block mm. in the fresh air uh, and get a bit of exercise and it wasn't raining. Yeah. 
thank you God that we have uh, we're in a safe country with a roof over our heads and uh, we've got food to eat thank you God oh he's doing another one well we're building you've, a got, tower. you've got two colours there well you're you're an odd height <laughs> so you're an odd height uh, well, whatever uh, thank you uh, that we're going to have some fun on Thursday evening at the quiz night yes yeah, right, great. Um, let's find this one. I'll go to green now. Um, thank you, God, for learning new things. Okay, right, so you get the idea. Oh, that's not very strong, is it? That's Paul and Dan. Nigel put that together. He needs a capstone. Yeah. That one's called Jesus. <laughs> thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. <laughs> okay, I've got another challenge for you grown ups. And that is um, whether you've got bricks or playing cards or something, fi find eight of them or draw eight of them. And I've got the challenge to uh, remember the eight points of John's sermon Whoa. on Sunday. We were struggling to do that after the first after the first ten minutes. Yeah. We had to go back and look them, look up, yeah. look them up yeah, again. Definitely. So have a go at that. Very good. So we thought. Just for something, something slightly different, given that we're on strong towers and that verse and building towers, that we would have a go at that song that we most of us know pretty well. And this will be a, a bit of a novelty, I think. Not sure what this is going to sound like or look like or whatever, or, but we'll give it a go anyway. So, yes, Tina's got her maracas, a bit of percussion. Uh, you want to dance around? Feel free. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to sit down and play. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Oh, Jesus, who is a strong tower. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, Father, we thank you that you have given us your son Jesus, and uh, he's our place of safety. He is a strong tower. He's our rescuer. He's our friend. He's our lover. He's our uh, everything. And uh, yeah, we thank you, Father, for Jesus, the strong tower, and the. Um, just been an amazing friend and the rock. Jesus, we thank you for everything that you are to us and everything that you are to this world. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Just one. Oh, there you go.
have your maracas. <laughs> Just one little point. It's interesting to see that tower because although it looks I'm sure the background looks very alp-like uh, the type of tower not so much the the bit up at the top but uh, the way that the the door is quite a way up the building and you pull up the ladder and you say that is pretty much the sort of style that will have been built uh, in the Old Testament times and uh, people will have come into the tower for safety and pulled up the ladder closed the door and it would have been very difficult for people to get in so we have one who is a strong tower mm. that we can run to so thank you for that so let's thank build you. a strong tower of thanksgiving yeah. and prayer and praise and praise yeah <laughs> thank you okay Ooh, and i'm going to start talking in a minute from mark chapter 11 i'm going to carry on with jesus journey towards the cross She's going to get something. She's hiding. Go on, sneak behind. Watch as she's going past. There we go. What are you doing? Are you going to sit and listen? All right, okay. She's hiding in the background. That's going to put me off, isn't it, that? There we go. So, we're going to have a think about uh, continuing on on this journey of Jesus coming into Jerusalem and uh, heading towards the cross. And we're going to read from... Uh, Mark chapter 11, I'm going to start at verse 12. So this is the day after, if you remember, we pick, well, let's pick up at verse 11. Uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem, went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts and as he taught them he said is it not written my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations but you have made it a den of robbers the chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching when evening came, they went out of the city. So Jesus has come back into the temple. And uh, we're going to skip the fig tree bit. We're going to come back to that tomorrow. And he comes into the temple and he overturns the tables of people buying and selling, money changing uh, and... Uh, people selling doves he wouldn't allow them to to carry merchandise through the temple courts and we just need to understand a little bit there that if you if you were to go to the temple in Jesus time then uh, it was regarded as such a holy place that the the ordinary money that you would buy and sell things in the marketplace with would not be uh, good enough to use in the temple so the temple had its own coins and uh, if you wanted to go and buy uh, the doves or the sheep uh, or whatever that you were going to sacrifice, then you would need to first of all go to the money changers. And the money changers would then change your money, obviously for a fee, a commission, uh, so that you could then have the temple money. And through with the temple money, you could then go and buy the animals that you were coming to sacrifice. And, and so Jesus uh, was stopping these people from operating so according to uh, to mark uh, jesus went away after the triumphal entry and came back the next day uh, other gospels actually have that slightly differently but given that we're in mark that's what we're going to stick with and he proceeds to clear out the temple and this feels like quite an aggressive act uh, perhaps the most aggressive that we see 
uh, Jesus undertaking and one of the gospels talks about him making a uh, a whip of cord and uh, uh, and effectively beating people out of of the temple uh, and overturning the tables and then he he goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7 but I thought it would be helpful rather than just quote that particular verse to have a look at uh, Isaiah because it it's a very important passage that he's quoting from uh, and, and it provides a context for something of what's going on here so Isaiah chapter 56 uh, is headed up in the NIV of with salvation for others and verse 1 starts off this is what the Lord says maintain justice and do what is right for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed blessed is the man who does this the man who holds it fast who keeps the sabbath without desecrating it and keeps his hand from doing any evil let no foreigner who has bound himself to the lord say the lord will surely exclude me from his people and let not any eunuch complain i am only a dry tree for this is what the lord says to the eunuchs who keep my sabbath who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant to them i will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters i will give them an everlasting name that will be will not be cut off and foreigners who bind themselves to the lord to serve him to love the name of the lord and to worship him all who keep the sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant these i will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer that's the verse that jesus is quoting these i will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations the sovereign lord declares he who gathers the exiles of israel i will gather still others to them besides those already gathered so that passage that ch first half first two-thirds of the chapter of isaiah 56 is a chapter about those who are not included as jews either because they're aliens or in the case of the eunuchs because they are uh, uh, deformed regarded as being uh, deformed and therefore not allowed into uh, the inner areas of the temple uh, and the uh, the aliens weren't allowed into the inner areas of the temple so so basically that 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 prophecy from isaiah is is basically saying that those who uh, on the face of it feel excluded from god's covenant and from fellowship with him that they will be allowed in they will be allowed to come in and the prophecy finishes off with saying that uh, god will welcome those people and he will actually go out and look for more people to add to to those who are already his so what's what's going on here with this passage uh, this uh, story of jesus cleansing the temple well Jesus was overturning uh, service which was not service of him but was self-serving service which excluded people and not included people rules which kept people out and not drew people in all the the things that were going on in the temple in Jesus time the rules the regulations the money changing the sacrifices they were uh, in many ways the way they were operating was excluding many many people excluding the alien excluding the uh, those who were deformed or crippled they were not allowed into the inner areas of the temple and Jesus is saying no that's not what this temple is about because my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations not praying for all nations but a place of access for all nations to come 
and communicate and fellowship and commune with God himself. So Jesus was overturning unfruitful and inauthentic service and ministry. I'm sure that the people who were doing this, they were almost certainly going to have been men, uh, the men who were doing this, uh, who were clearly making money on this process, they felt that they were bringing service to God, part of their worship, part of their service and ministry in the operating of the temple. And Jesus was challenging that as being unfruitful and inauthentic service and ministry. So the question from today's passage, uh, continuing on with the doing the factory reset and last night or yesterday looking at what does fruitful and authentic worship look like? The question is, what does authentic and fruitful ministry look like? So just go back a chapter briefly to Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 32 to 34 and then verse 45. And this is Jesus setting his face towards Jerusalem. So in chapter 10, Mark 10, verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he looked, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John go into their conversation about who's the greatest and wanting to sit on his left and his right, uh, which no doubt will have miffed the other disciples. But then Jesus finishes off that section by saying this in verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And although we're not called to give our life as a ransom for many, because that ransom has been paid by the perfect Lamb of God, we are called to sacrificial service. So what does authentic and fruitful ministry and service look like? Well, it looks like pursuing the purpose and calling of the Father. That's what Jesus was doing. In setting his face towards Jerusalem and towards the cross, Jesus was saying, I am coming to complete the task that the Father has given me. I'm coming to do the service and bring the ministry that he has given me to do. And it is not self-serving, but self-sacrificial. It's a hallmark of Christian service. Not that we have to punish ourselves in any kind of way. It's not that type of self-sacrificial. But it is, we have come to serve others, just as Jesus modelled for us. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. So if the King of Heaven, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, comes as a servant, how much more should we be doing that? And then what's the heart of service? And as I was reflecting on that, my mind really went to uh, perhaps the only passage that we could go to, 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 to think about that. And that's 1 Corinthians 13. So I'm going to finish off by reading uh, those very well-known verses. But I want to put it into this context. What does fruitful authentic service and ministry look like and now i will show you the most excellent way if i speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love i am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol if i have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have faith that can move mountains but have not love I am nothing. 
if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I am nothing. Paul isn't being negative about prophesying or speaking in tongues or having wisdom uh, or anything like that. He, he's not being negative about those things. He's simply saying that those things need to be filled, they need to be fruitful and authentic with the love that brought Jesus to earth. So the characteristic of Jesus coming to serve the Father was because of his love for the Father. The, the need to bring salvation was because of the love for the people so that they could be reconciled to the Father and he faced the cross. So authentic and fruitful ministry and service is characterised by love. So it's not that aspects of ministry and service shouldn't include these things they absolutely should include these things but they should be characterized by love and so you can you can substitute authentic worship authentic ministry and service looks like this is patient is kind it doesn't envy it doesn't boast it's not proud it's not rude it's not self-seeking it's not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. It never fails. Is our service and our ministry characterised in that way, which can be summed up in that one word? Is it filled with love? Father, we thank you that the service and ministry that Jesus modelled for us was filled with love. Because Jesus is love. Heavenly Father, we invite you to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. That he would examine our hearts and he would point out anything within us where our service, our ministry, our worship has not been authentic, has not been fruitful because it's not been characterised by love, love for you and love for those around us. Father, where you point those things out to us, we ask that you would forgive us, cleanse us with the blood of Jesus, fill us again with the Holy Spirit and anoint those areas of ministry and service by your powerful presence in our lives and particularly with the characteristic of love fill us afresh with your love love for you love for one another love for our neighbours and love for ourselves help us to grow authentic fruitful ministry and service that will see the name of Jesus glorified and honoured. Amen. <laughs>